Okay, so this is a sort of a run through the sort of things that we do at OA. Um, and it's not all formalised yet, some of it is work in progress. I'm not going to talk about me specifically, uh, unlike some of our other speakers, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, as a sort of a, a quick intro, though, I got into environmental archaeology in what is probably the heyday of environmental archaeology back in the 1980s when um, Historic England had a series of research labs um, around the country with specialist teams of environmental specialists in them. And that gave people like me a real opportunity to learn the skills at the hands of very experienced practitioners. And it's personally, I think it's a real shame that we don't have those laboratories anymore. Um, and that we, you know, the people that used to work in them are now even older than me. And so we are the, the old and the older school talking to hopefully the new generation that will take over. So where I put pictures of people, um, like Laura here, these are people that have actually come through um, and been trained in environmental archaeology through OA. So this, I say, is a bit of a ramble through showing you how you can enter commercial archaeology from a, a whole range of different backgrounds and develop a certain level of skill, you know, to suit the individual and, and move on, not necessarily becoming a specialist, sometimes becoming a generalist, sometimes moving into something else, but there are lots of different career pathways and opportunities. So first of all, I thought we'd better say, because I wasn't sure if everybody here was going to be an environmental archaeologist, who actually are we? Um, the, th the theme was specialists, okay? So I suppose the the, the um, specialist um, uh, definition is that we're practitioners using a set of techniques or specialisms in archaeological science, and that's, I guess, how people think of environmental archaeologists. However, um, I must admit, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine because an environmental archaeologist is so much more than a technician. <laughs> uh, when I did my master's at Sheffield in environmental archaeology and paleoeconomy, and there was always an argument between um, David Gilbertson, who was head of environmental archaeology, and people like Robin Torrance, who was a theoretical archaeologist. And basically, those who were not environmental archaeologists um, would argue that environmental archaeologists were effectively brain dead, nearly capable of sorting things under microscopes, identifying them, and writing dull reports. And I hope that this session will, you know, other people will bring out the fact that we are a lot more than that. So we're actually researchers concerned with the ecological study of the human past and the study of man's relation and interaction with the environment in the past through archaeology and related disciplines. And I didn't come up with this myself, I fear. It comes from one of the Association for Environmental, Environmental Archaeology documents of some while ago. So we look at things like landscape reconstruction, climate change, how people utilise the landscape, what they ate, how they obtained the foods, and what they did for a living. And this is clearly critical to archaeological study. These are the things that actually define who we are as people and how we, how we interacted with the landscape. So one could say that environmental archaeology is actually the soul of archaeology, the people in archaeology. So what is a specialist then? So, they're people responsible for leading undertaking the research um, in every aspect of archaeology, from the field, into post ex and into scientific analysis. And we may have specialised knowledge of one eco-fact, or we may cover a much broader remit. We are responsible for processing and report um, our materials, and we prepare the archive for long-term deposition and curation and we supervise less skilled personnel in carrying out these functions. So that is sort of my job description as environmental manager. We can work in site, on site, in an office, or in a lab. Uh, in commercial archaeology, we work in all of those environments, although depending on which unit you work for, lab is a bit of a notional <laughs> concept, truthfully. Um, and we work in the private, public, and charitable sect sectors for organisation of all sizes. Um, and that uh, comes from a Historic England trailblazer document. So, 
some specialisms, and this is not all of them. Archaeobotany, archaeozoology, of which I am one of those. Archaeoentomology, uh, mollusks. So you're going to hear about archaeobotany, and you're going to hear about um, snail analysis, mollusk analysis. Also pollen specialists, specialists in phytoliths, specialists in diatoms, foraminifera and ostracods, soils and sediments, and then there are other smaller things as well. But within a commercial unit, we tend to focus on archaeobotany and archaeozoology, and that is obviously because they come, most sites have seeds, most sites have bones. So if we have people who are employed as full-time specialists, and OA has quite a few of them, we, they focus on the items which you recover most regularly. Um, we send out our um, samples for insect analysis um, externally. We do have a palynologist, but most um, small units wouldn't have enough work for a palynologist. So again, that's another specialism which sometimes is done at other university facilities, or uh, you may get freelance specialists. Uh, Phytolists, datums, forams, and ostracods. Again, those are external specialists, perhaps especially at the Natural History Museum, for example, because there is just not enough of that sort of work to keep somebody going full time in an archaeological company. Uh, we have geoarchaeologists in Oxford Archaeology, as do some of the other bigger units. I'm not really going to talk about geoarchaeology, merely to point out, I think, that there's a sort of a grey area between what is environmental archaeology and what is geoarchaeology, which many, pe many people don't understand where the boundary lies and I think that's because it, there isn't a clear boundary yeah I, I mean even I don't understand where the boundary lies sometimes um, I mean basically we're all involved in the study of landscapes so how do you get into environmental archaeology in a commercial unit well most people I have to say come in with some sort of postgrad degree with an environmental or a geoarchaeological component some come in with PhDs and that's tends at the moment to be particularly true of archaeozoologists, and I think that's just a factor in the, uh, it's explicable by the number of um, PhD students there are doing archaeozoology at the moment, that there's a plethora of people with PhDs. It's not essential. Um, master's degrees uh, are very valuable, largely, I think, because undergraduate degrees these days don't seem to do, they don't seem to focus on archaeological science or environmental archaeology to any large degree. Very few of them do. Where I'm mentioning these apprenticeship schemes, I'm going to talk about that in the very briefest term later because that's a historic England initiative that OA has been involved in, in working with historic England and with CIFA to develop these apprenticeships. So that's something to think about for the future. We also employ people from the fieldwork teams to come into the environmental department to give things a go, see if they fancy developing those skills further. And you can come in as a volunteer um, and again, I've referred to the Level 3 and 4 Archaeological Technician Apprenticeships, which Historic England is developing. And that's going to be a really valuable programme, I think. I think um, there's a stand, uh, I notice, in the main hall um, with paperwork about these apprenticeships. So basically, every big company now has to pay the apprenticeship levy. And it's a government initiative. So eventually, Schemes will be set up within these organisations uh, to, and the money that we currently pay the government in tax for these apprenticeships, we'll be able to get some of it back to develop the apprenticeships in-house. And the level three and four apprenticeships are particularly tailored towards people coming in, you know, without uh, degree qualifications necessarily through the technician route. Some examples, not exclusive, of degree courses you can do at master's level. And I just did this through a quick Google search of all those universities which seem to offer something which had environmental or bioarchaeology in the title. So you can see there's quite a few of them. Um, some of them helpfully have environmental archaeology as the main descriptor. Uh, Reading, Sheffield and UCL do. But there are also um, strong environmental components of uh, bioarchaeology bio or um, even archaeology, MA, MSc courses, where you can pick your modules. So, for example, I know in Nottingham, you can effectively do an environmental master's qualification by picking those modules at master's level. At OA, we are developing a specialist training plan 
specifically to bring people through uh, the um, environmental... Well, let's start again. We're developing a specialist training programme of which environmental archaeology is one component. We've, we're just in the process of developing this, so this is kind of ongoing. We haven't quite embedded it yet. And um, we've, we've started out, I think, with pottery specialists. Enviro is probably the next one to start with. But you can come in through a number of different entry routes. You can come in through uh, the fieldwork or volunteering stage. You can come in with a master's qualification, or you can come in as a, somebody who's already working within the environmental department who wants to develop further into specialist skills. So you can see we've got a very posh looking specialist training portfolio and we have validation points that, we, that um, we'll be using in order to progress our staff. Now the title I was kind of given for this talk was processing and you'll see that I'm not really specifically talking about processing but processing is quite an important, nay critical part of environmental archaeology and you can't really truthfully be an environmental specialist, I don't think, unless you've got your hands and grubby um, at the processing end of things. So here we have three members of staff, one of whom, um, Lee, is no longer with us because he's gone on to do a PhD. So that's good. And if he's actually doing it in Fish Remains, great. Right. <laughs> but, um, but yes, um, and he was in our field team to begin with. So he's come in through the field route. Julia, in the middle, came in with a master's qualification um, in, well, she, in, um, what it, was it Bristol anyway, an environmental kind of master's degree, yeah, whatever it was called. Anyhow, um, Julia also entered through our field team, having done that master's qualification, but made it very clear that she was interested in environmental archaeology, and so has progressed through OA, and by doing also doing a part-time research degree at Reading, um, now into a quite experienced archaeobotanist, and she's developing her skills as we speak. Sharon, at the back, uh, has a Master's in Archaeological Practice, but, but again came in through the field team route. So Sharon decided that she, you know, she really enjoyed the work that she'd done processing samples and that she wanted to develop environmental skills and she is now in a training program to become an archaeobotanist. So, you know, it is possible without a specific environmental master's qualification to come through and you can sort of drop off at any point within the training program, you know, if you decide you want to go a different way. So, processing, really important, um, really important because the quality of the material that special look, specialists look at is entirely dependent on the quality of the flocks, um, for example, for archaeobotany that people are given. If their samples aren't collected properly on site, if they're not processed correctly, then a lot of money can be spent and wasted on material that is not of high enough quality, which is why processing is such a key skill. Uh, and it's a, such a good way of getting everybody involved in environmental archaeology because once you start putting things through a sieve, you start refining the sample, you get the flock, you can have a look under, under the microscope, you can actually see what's coming out of these different types of materials. You don't just put things through a flotation tank, which is what the previous slide was showing. The Siraf tank, the water flotation system, is what everybody thinks of as environmental archaeology processing. It's what you do on your research excavation on site where you've got your tank and everybody processes, hopefully everybody processes some samples these de days on excavations. I see some cynical looks, but um, mm -hmm. one would hope. Uh, but ha there are different types of processing uh, for different sorts of organic materials. So this lovely waterlogged well, which we had in Bristol, requires careful wet sieving through a sieve stack and sorting the material wet for the archaeobotanical remains within it. Snails have a different method of bucket flotation, which I'm sure Mike will be talking about, so I won't go into that. Uh, and insect remains uh, will have um, a paraffin flotation technique at the end of the wet sieving process. 
So if we're bringing somebody in through the training route to become, for example, environmental supervisor, starting at the technician grade, they would need to be proficient in understanding and processing for different types of remains. So I don't know, we can actually read that, that's quite good, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, but these are the sort of um, things that we are looking to score in the learning plan to make sure that people understand every stage of the process. So we would expect somebody starting out as an environmental technician to understand how to collect samples, when to collect samples, types of preservation one can anticipate, when to take samples for water off of remains, what's the difference between a wet and an actually anaerobic waterlogged um, deposit, which is more tricky than you might believe. <coughs> how to process the different types of samples, how to keep clear records, which is critical and again underappreciated when people start in Enviro. Um, how to store um, and record the remains, how to basically record them in, in the post ex process to understand how environmental remains are used as part of the post-excavation process. We also need to understand the basic archiving requirements. All of these are laid down in Historic England guidelines, and we have our own guidelines too. And then we move on from those basic processing and, and understanding uh, mechanisms in order uh, to get people to start to look at the sort of things that you get in plot and residues and write a basic evaluation report. So by the end of this training process, we would expect people to be able to basically identify one sort of eco fact, not to become a specialist per se, but to be able to um, identify child grain as child grain, to be able to identify chaff as chaff. Um, to be able to say this sample has got potential for further work, this sample has not got potential for further work, this sample has got mollusks, they're not all intrusive, there's a variety of species, that sort of level of, of um, identification skills. They would start to identify one sort of eco-fact, learn about reference collections, learn about how to tabulate, learn about taxonomic nomenclature, and start to develop a broader understanding of a single special, specialism. And we do expect people to do a little bit of work in their own time. Um, when we take people onto the training programme, and I should have probably said, the stage one is testing aptitude. So we'll give people a placement of something like a month, and we'll see how they come on. And if they show themselves to be proficient, enthusiastic, and wanting to learn, then we'll move them through to a three-month or even longer or six month placement to develop those skills. But if somebody is a bit of a job's worth, you know, is, is doing it because they don't want to be in the field, that's quite common, uh, especially over winter, then we would tactfully tell them that perhaps this wasn't the job for them and, and drop them at that stage because we do expect people to book in a bit of legwork themselves. And, you know, the value of that can be seen by the specialists who have come through the system. Even though it wasn't formalised, you know, we have moved people through this way. So these are the scorings um, at each stage in the game. And this makes it very explicit to people how they're actually doing. And they have to take all five, we have to score them at five, really, to move them on to the next stage in the training program. And this is the sort of thing that we're aiming for. One of the roles that can be very valuable, particularly on large excavations. Um, when we've, we've had this role for our Terminal 5, our Heathrow infrastructure excavations, we've had it for CTRL, we had it for um, the East Kent Axis Road, we have had it for a big project on the A2, and we ran several projects in France, where you need somebody on site um, who can advise the field teams on when to sample, how to sample, can, do, can organize some basic processing on site and some feedback to the field teams. So this here is Laura, who you saw earlier, who is no longer with us, sadly, but she was the environmental supervisor on the East Kent Axis Road. And her job was, as I say, to coordinate the sampling on site, 
in collaboration with me to set the strategy and make sure that it's being adhered to, to review it periodically to tell me if it wasn't going to plan and where we needed to address things, to make sure that there was a throughput. We had an on-site processing facility, which you can see there. It's another trainee doing the processing. So we would process things on site, which is quite essential. That was a lovely shed, I have to say, mm -hmm. for these contactors. We've never had a client set up such a lovely, lovely facility as that. <laughs> um, but so Laura's job was to make sure that the samples were going through properly, the plots were clean, um, the processes were being adhered to. And then the basic information would be recorded on site on a database. We, she would do a quick assessment, and she is doing her quick assessment, of all of the plots to decide, oh, sorry, I'm going to have to whiz, um, which ones were worth taking further and which ones worth take, weren't taking further. This means you can process a lot of samples, but the specialist doesn't need necessarily to look at all of them. So she would do that preliminary scan and say, that's rubbish, we don't need to take any more of, the, of that feature. Um, and, you know, job done, recorded on the database, quickly scanned, not interesting, um, can be discarded, basically. Uh, but other ones, she would say, yes, it's got a decent quality of charred grain in it, there's, you know, there's chaff, it can answer. These, these questions that we set in the sampling strategy, send that to the specialist. We also were lucky enough on some of our projects to have IT on site, and so those results which were input into the database could then be plotted out so we could see where we'd taken the samples from, we could see which ones were productive, where they were coming from, that would inform the sampling strategy going forward. So, very quickly, archaeobotany, which I won't go into in much detail, is the next stage. When you've been through the trading process in, you know, at that level to become, a, um, say, an environmental supervisor, the next stage would be to specialise, and that's Julia specialising. We have a training route for archaeobotany, which you don't need to read all the details of, but effectively, again, it's, um, we're scoring against a certain level of ability. Um, along the way to becoming a specialist. We can do the same for archaeozoology. We haven't started it yet um, because the archaeozoologist is way too busy to mentor. But um, potentially we will get the same sort of training program in place for archaeozoology. And theoretically, we could do the same sort of thing for geoarchaeology. So at all of these routes, it's possible to bring people in and develop their skills through a formal training program. And just to finish then, there are challenges with this. It would be simplistic to say that all always goes well. Uh, it works in large companies where you have a good reference collection, but it's absolutely essential. You can't develop people as specialists if you don't in-house have the facilities to do it. You need a very experienced mentor, and we're coming up against that to a certain extent. And we need to find ways of improving the mentoring schemes because Clearly, if you're going to develop specialists in-house, it has to be done thoroughly. You have to be able to provide at least as good training as they would get at university, truthfully, um, because we don't want to be lowering standards by training in-house. Neither allocated training budget for both the trainer and the trainee, and this is always a bit of a bone of contention in a commercial company where we have to make a profit. Need access to a library actually, because you need to be able to read. Increasingly, things are available online, and that is great. That makes it an awful lot easier. But still, there is a need, you know, to look at, referen uh, to, to look at um, comparative assemblages, to, to go to the library to read literature. You can't, the problem that commercial companies often have is that we work, to a certain extent, in isolation, and we need to improve, truthfully. Not all specialisms can be taught in-house realistically, so this isn't a panacea. There's still a huge role for universities. And therefore, the way forward, in my opinion, is to try and improve our partnerships with academic institutions to make the most of the experience that we have uh, uh, and see if we can't find a way to tie in some of this mentoring with academic institutions. And I know that Historic England um, are quite engaged with the idea of you know, trying to provide training for the discipline. So I think it's all good, it's all coming forward, and there are ways through, and I think that's what I'd just like to say at the end. There are, there are lots of ways for people who want to develop a career 
you know, to, to do it. And it doesn't always mean that you have to commit yourself for life. You can have a go, you know, and if you don't like it, then do something else. <laughs> Thank you.